My name is Dr. William Foles. I'm a wildlife vet working in the Eastern Cape of South Africa and we are talking about the movement of elephants across multiple destinations in this country. The reason why we are moving these animals today is because we are wanting to distribute genetics to various parts of the country. We also have a situation in some of the reserves where these animals have been part of a closed system for multiple years now and getting rid of some of the breeding bulls is an important part of allowing space for new bulls to come into those herds and to allow new genetics to disperse within those herds. So that's the reason behind the procedure. It's something we do for multiple species. The problem we face with elephants is that they are massive and very unusual in the anatomy and so the logistics around elephant relocation is very interesting and very challenging and that's what we are tackling today. So the first challenge around logistics is planning and there's always a lot of planning when it comes to wildlife relocations but I think elephants specifically requires a number of moving parts. There are multiple NGOs involved, there are funders involved, there's obviously the game reserve crews, the ecologists that do the initial work in working out which animals need to be moved and, and why. So really any any three will work. And then on the day all of this has to come together along with some very heavy machinery and some ingenious mechanical engineering that takes place in order to modify these procedures and make sure that you know we we are adjusting to the challenges and, and improving on what we do and so today in particular one of the biggest challenges we are trying to overcome is how do we manipulate large elephant bulls these animals weigh over 7,000 kilograms and that is a, a huge undertaking you will see that the most important piece of equipment that we have here today is this crane uh, the crane can lift 32 tons uh, which looks like an overkill if you're only lifting seven tons, but in order to have the reach required to get inside the thicket and lift an elephant up that might be five to seven meters from the, the crane, you need that, that leverage. The other piece of equipment that is vital which is a, a new piece designed during lockdown by some incredibly experienced elephant relocation specialists is this recovery box. This has only been used seven times in its history and we are hoping to apply it to the relocation of five elephant bulls in this operation and learn from it as we go. First thing to do is to find the animal. We have people out there looking for him at the moment. What I'm busy doing is getting all the darts ready. To actually immobilize an elephant takes a relatively large amount of opioids in our language. In this case, 16 milligrams of a very potent opioid called etorphine. We mix it with another one called thiofentanyl. These drugs are at least a thousand times more potent than morphine. And we mix them with a, another cocktail, a zaparone, a tranquilizer, a, another ingredient that you actually get in snake venom, which speeds up the absorption from darting to falling over. With those drugs in the system, generally speaking, the anesthetics are nice and stable. The longer the procedure yeah. takes, the closer they become to complications and in some cases as they metabolize the drug they can start waking up while we're busy working with them. Because of all the mechanics and the people around them, my job is to ensure that the animal stays down safely. We do top them up, so just before we're going to put the straps on to lift him up with his feet hanging, we give him a little top up and, and that's just to ensure that he gets moved into that recovery box asleep and he doesn't injure anyone you will notice as he swings into that recovery box now someone has to walk in front of him holding his trunk so that 
it doesn't get bent and, and suffocate him. So there are moments here where, you know, if he had to wake up suddenly with a human being inside that box, it would be catastrophic. And we have to ensure that he remains asleep, but still in a physiological situation that's comfortable for him. The truck will come in um, and then we're going to lift him up with his feet like we normally do and then we're going to put some straps around his shoulders and his, uh, and his hindquarters. It's a new technique. Kester Vickery is the most experienced elephant relocator in Africa and we're very fortunate to have him and his team here today who are really in charge of all the ground logistics. We're going to take off now in the helicopter. The bull has been located nearby, fortunately. First mission is to move him with the helicopter closer to an open area. That just makes all the logistics easier. So if we can get that right, then we've really succeeded in overcoming that first problem of accessibility and getting this heavy equipment close to where the bull lands. So the dart is in, the elephant doesn't want to stay in the open area and he keeps on wanting to move into the thickets which is a natural behaviour for them. The helicopter is under enormous pressure to try and keep him either in the open or at least on the fringes of the thicket so that we don't have to destroy too much vegetation in, in getting the crane truck in. Luckily he has now fallen reasonably close to an accessible area. We've been able to reverse the truck in close to him with the reach of the crane. Once we've secured him in a, in a lateral position, checked his breathing and applied the, the tracking device, this collar, which is really important for his destination um, monitoring and ecology. Then we can attach the straps to his feet and lift him up with that crane truck, put him on the back of the recovery vehicle and then move him from there to the recovery box which is this massive piece of steel that we will use to wake him up in. What this recovery crate enables is a vertical wake-up situation. This is very new technology. It's only been used a few times in its history and, and part of the procedure today is really to, to do more bulls like this. The new challenge is instead of them being pulled into the recovery box on their sides or lifted in by their feet, we're actually going to strap them in a way that we can swing them in using the crane but vertically in other words in a standing position but while they're still asleep 
and the mechanics of how that strapping works and how they, those straps can then get removed once that animal is woken up literally hanging with its feet down that makes today's procedure very stressful and complicated and a lot of moving parts have to all come together simultaneously for that to happen safely for the elephant and for the humans that are busy disconnecting all those attachment points. We have this situation then where he's being swung into the crane truck. He's literally hanging in these straps so his legs are, are below him and someone has to guide his trunk into that box. Standing above him on the top of the box are a number of people with hooks and those hooks are designed to hook the straps. The roof of the recovery box also flaps open. Then we lift him up with a crane so that we can hang in there and access a vein. And that vein is used to inject the antidote. This is the drug that we use to wake them up. That gets given and then there's this very intricate moment where he starts to wake up. He gets full use of his trunk. He begins to take pressure on his legs. want him to be able to stand but there's only about a, a 20 to 30 second window to get all the straps off him. If we don't get them off in that period then his trunk is then mobile, he can start pulling on straps, he can get, reach up and, and grab people through that hole in the top. Those straps have got to be unhooked and pulled out. The flaps on the top have got to be closed and secured so that he can't reach out and cause any harm and he's got to be standing safely on his feet. All those moving parts have to come together in a half a minute. Actually the other way around, sorry, go that one. Yeah. Okay. So I think even for me, just the sight of these massive behemoths being slung into you know, a, a wake-up crate, literally hanging with their feet and trunk dangling is 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 something that's that's quite breathtaking. represents an enormous amount of thought and engineering that's gone into this process. It does allow the future of elephant relocations to happen with less logistical challenges involved. And if this method works, which so far it looks like it's working really well, it does represent a, a sort of a new age in elephant relocations. This piece of engineering is a critical tool, I think, and it will enable elephants to be moved in their hundreds safely because we anticipate more and more now that for the conservation of the species, mechanical solutions to these very challenging logistical problems you know, have to be improved and, and this is certainly a great step forward in the right direction. The bull's inside the recovery crate. He's standing nicely, he's breathing well, so anesthetically he's out of danger. What we now have to do is back him from this box into the truck that's going to be transporting him to his next destination. Fortunately, elephants walk backwards quite easily. So just by prodding him gently, he now uh, walks back through an open door into the truck. This is a large pantechnican, basically, with a modified crate on the back. 
and he will travel standing like that for days if necessary. We tranquilize them suitably so that they are calm for the whole journey and then the roadshow begins. What we do as we're traveling through the countryside, the truck driver is in constant communication with us. If that bull starts to become restless, he can feel him moving around on the back there. They are big enough, actually, that if they were to panic and move around too quickly, they could, they could roll that truck if, if it was going around a corner and an elephant started bouncing around in the back. We monitor that. We stop periodically. We check on him. We top him up if we need to. And that goes on and on until we reach our final destination. When we get to the other side, really important to make sure that he comes out into his new surroundings calm. We don't want them charging off and, and being in a panic. We just open the doors very quietly and calmly and just let them walk out when they're ready. And if the drugs are working well, then they come out and they look as if they've, they've never been through this ordeal. Those golden moments when you think of all the preparation, all the logistics, all the risks that have gone into an operation, that moment when they step off on the other side and just walk into that new habitat, sometimes they start eating immediately. It's just something really special. Uh, you know, you've achieved something quite amazing actually for the recipients of these animals it's a very exciting day for conservation in their lives I think it's important to acknowledge that you know these animals can travel hundreds, maybe thousands of kilometers by themselves. Uh, part of the natural migration of things meant that these operations that we are undertaking now were actually not necessary when elephants had right of passage across these landscapes. What we have done as humans is we've encroached on the environment, we've built barriers like fences and highways. And so everything that we do today is actually a culmination of human impact. And, and we now have to compensate for that by devising ways to, to relocate animals from one protected area to another. And that in a way is quite sad. And I think our real challenge for the future, now that we have recognized the problems that we are causing on this planet, is to reverse some of that damage that we've done, to take down the fences, to recreate corridors so that these kinds of relocations are not needed as often as, as we are currently having to do them. And that is a very exciting frontier for us. Connected conservation, functional ecosystems, large tracts of land, the, the sort of scale of freedom that allows animals like this to exist in a peaceful way and, and to distribute their own genetics and as nature sees fit. That's the challenge that we face. And every time we do a procedure like this, it's a reminder, I suppose, of, of just how much impact we've had on the lives of mega herbivores like elephants. They are one of the most charismatic species out there in the world. They are highly intelligent animals. Much of their behavior resonates with, with human behavior and, and human intelligence. And I think for that reason, we have developed a specific affinity with elephants. 
that makes them very special and I think there's a lot we can learn from the species just by interacting with them, engaging with them and they're certainly a very important piece of the puzzle of reconnecting humanity back to nature understanding just how important that interrelationship is between ourselves as human beings and our natural world and how dependent we are, interdependent we are on the natural world. So their future survival is intimately associated with ours at many levels and it's so important to look after them well, to create space for them and in the meantime to manage them as responsibly as we possibly can.